Hi everyone. Um, just a few announcements before we begin with today's video, uh, which will probably be shorter than usual, and that's probably going to happen a little bit more often these days. Um, but first off, big, big fucking news, holy shit. Um, if there's anyone who doesn't know yet, um, I heard this morning straight from the horse's mouth, uh, Greg's son, Clayton, that Gregory Allen Elliott has been found not guilty of criminal harassment in a potentially precedent-setting case, uh, testing the limits of free speech in Canada. I'm hoping to have more detailed information as far as the judge's statements on why he made the decision and things like that over the next uh, day or two, but for now I can't really say anything about it that hasn't already been said by Lauren Southern of Rebel Media, and I'm going to put the link to that article uh, that she wrote in the low bar. As you can imagine, I'm really happy for Greg and his family. I've gotten to know them a little bit um, over the course of the last several months. And I'm also intensely relieved for anyone in Canada who, uh, like myself, says controversial things uh, that lie in direct opposition to the prevailing cultural narrative. Um, after looking uh, quite deeply into the case, um, mostly through a blog called Genuine Witty, and I'm going to leave links to that in the low bar as well, uh, I can't help but conclude that this was a case that only got this far um, because of um, uh, the complainant being a politically connected and politically active uh, public figure who was using her connections and society's hypersensitivity toward uh, potential threats to women um, to launch a vindictive bullying campaign against someone with less power and influence who just happened to really vigorously disagree um, with her behavior. Her weapons were the very institutions we're all supposed to be able to rely on um, on an equal basis for protection and redress, and her campaign against him dragged on for three fucking years. Three years this man has been going through this. It's just absolutely stunning. Um, if there's any argument uh, that the uh, saying the process is the punishment um, I think that this this is a really good argument that that's very very true um, I did do two videos on this case which I'll also link to uh, while it was ongoing and uh, I'm as I said gonna link to the website genuine witty it's run by a man named Greg Renouf um, he is stated he's based in Toronto and so he's been in the courtroom for a lot of this trial and covering the case from start to finish. He's also got a highly detailed accounting, uh, graphic accounting of the co-complainants connections with politicians, law enforcement, uh, journalists at the local level in Toronto, and even, you know, insinuations of some at the political, uh, at the, sorry, provincial level. So this entire case kind of just reeked from the very start of, um, you know, uh, corruption and people abusing uh, their connections with uh, with people who have influence. And uh, every single controversial online public figure should be breathing a sigh of relief at this verdict, and that even includes feminists. So, moving on. After some thought on how I've been approaching my channel, which has been almost sort of not at all, um, and I've horribly neglected it for some time. I, I've come to a few decisions. I know a lot of you really like the long form scripted videos and they're not going to be completely going away by any means, but it's, it's really difficult, uh, not just to come up with new things to say in that format, um, you know, things that I haven't already said before, lots, uh, but like, it's difficult to invest that kind of time. Um, as much as I don't do the frills and animations and backdrops and green screens and split images and all of those things, those bells and whistles, because I'm like incompetent at stuff like that, I can still, it can still take anywhere from like 12 to over 20 hours to, to prepare a 30 minute video from start to finish. And it's hard to get motivated to sink that amount of time when it involves so much rehashing things that I've already talked about or that you've already heard, um, you know, in my earlier videos. 
So what I'm planning starting next week is to sort of put out two 10 to 15 minute videos or maybe one longer one every week. And some of them might be answering questions or comments uh, that I get in emails um, or in comment threads. And, uh, you know, some might be uh, things that I have to say about other videos, me commenting just in general on, say, a point someone made in another video. The focus is going to remain mostly the same, uh, you know, analysis of gender psychology and gender politics through an evolutionary lens, including lots and lots and lots of anti-feminism. Uh, I might miss a week or two here, um, given the vagaries of the universe, but I'm hoping that these are achievable goals for me. In addition, depending on how things worked for you guys yesterday, uh, we might try hosting the occasional Honey Badger Rant Zerker on this channel. If you have strong feels about that one way or another, yes, do it, or God, no, um, just let me know in the comments here so I can get an idea of whether you guys would be interested in that happening. And uh, now we're going to get to the meat of this video, uh, which is an email that I received from someone I will call PB, and uh, I'm going to answer his points uh, one by one. Dear Ms. Strawn, I have recently retired and found that I have some free hours to explore to the internet. I can I came across feminist articles and videos on too many sites to count. I listened and com contemplated but found them wanting. They did not answer any of my questions but instead simply accused and complained. Dissatisfied I soon found you, Ms. Tiemann and Dr. Randomer Cam. I wish I knew his real name, the handsome bearded fellow with the funny hat who drinks too much. His name is Mike Stevenson, by the way arguing convincingly the other side of the issues. While I agree with a lot of what your team is saying, I have a question. When did we stop being sensitive to each other? Is this something the youth has lost? What happened to politeness? Has no one read Mr. Dale Carnegie's book? Why isn't it men for women and women for men for mutually assured success? We are compatible cooperative creatures. Why can't we expand our tribe instead of shrink it to the vanishing point? We help each other and do not hinder. Whatever happened to sacrifice for your mate? You know, lifelong commitments, working out our differences and staying together no matter what. All for one and one for all. Don't you and the feminists know that you would all be happier uh, cooperating with each other and maybe, just maybe, becoming, what's the cute millennial saying, BFFs? Someone you can count on, someone who has your back and who would rather die than lose your good opinion. Don't you all, femmes and anti-femmes, know that you are weaker and more vulnerable without each other? Together we stand, divided we fall, and fall you will if you do not out come to your senses and stop this war. This will not end well for the human race. Have you ever thought of making these arguments to your opponents? Strange and worrying. Sorry for the rant, but the winds are blowing cold, very cold, and no one gets out alive. Tell these femmes to find someone, anyone, to commit to them heart and soul. You all too. Stop thinking about how oppressed you all are and get cracking. You all may find something interesting. You all may actually become happy in the service of a respected and beloved other. Just my two cents. Be well. Okay, so there, there's a lot to unpack in here, PB. I'm going to pick out the bits that I think um, sort of encapsulate what you're trying to say here. Um... There is uh, more than one answer to a lot of your questions, uh, but I'm going to try and make it very, very simple, and I'm going to address them one at a time. So you asked, when did we stop being sensitive to each other? Um, why isn't it men for women and women for men for mutually assured success? Now, the first thing you have to understand is that feminism is not women. Uh, it doesn't represent the feelings and interests of a great number of women, and it never has, even going back to the suffragette era. Now, if you go all the way back to 1848 and the historic Women's Rights Conference at Seneca Falls in New York State, feminists have been using an us-versus-them mentality to drive a wedge between men and women right from the beginning. Suffragettes were wildly unpopular with the majority of women in the English-speaking world for a long time, in part because of their approach to gender relations. So when did we stop being sensitive to each other? Well, 
was when we started listening to and internalizing the rhetoric of feminists that began in Seneca Falls. The declaration of sentiments that emerged from that conference was as vitriolic and hateful a litany of accusations and grievances against men as any you're going to find among modern radicals. The majority of women at the time simply couldn't be convinced that their own sons, brothers, fathers, and husbands were responsible for constructing a society that privileged it themselves at the expense of women, at the expense of oppressing women. They couldn't be convinced that their own men were oppressing them and that their grandfathers had oppressed their grandmothers and that men in general have oppressed women since the dawn of history, which is what feminists would really like everybody to believe. Feminism essentially tried to tell women that men were not their partners, uh, but their rivals at best and their enemies at worst. It told women that the relationship between men and women was equivalent to that of a plantation owner and his slaves. Now, men have put up with this, this litany of accusations and this sort of smear campaign against them, mostly indulgently, you know, in silence for over 150 years. And there are a lot of reasons why they would put up with this kind of thing or even believe it, but I'm not going to go into all of them here. Other than to say that right from the beginning, feminism has been exploiting traditional gender roles in order to get its work done. And because of their ability to exploit certain predispositions of men, women, and society, over the decades, their oppressor-oppressed owner-slave construction of traditional gender relations has been mainstreamed, not just within feminism, but within the wider culture. They've been incredibly successful at mainstreaming these dehumanizing beliefs about men. And, I mean, you, you have to see men as less than human if you believe all of this stuff. It's my belief, from what I've learned about male and female psychology, that it would not only be impossible for men to construct an overarching system that oppresses all women to the privileging of all men, but it would be next to impossible for men who might find themselves living in such a society to tolerate it for long. As an aside, I'm also of the belief that women and men on the whole don't possess the same inherent psychological safeguards that would reliably prevent the opposite from ever happening. Since feminism began, we have had numerous feminists, and not just loons like Valerie Solanus, but tenured professors, suggest the mass culling of the male population is the only answer to the oppression of women. I would challenge any historian to provide me a single document, even during the most brutal patriarchies, written by a man arguing that women in general should be targeted for genocidal violence because of their sex. Where's the kill all women hashtag to balance the kill all men hashtag? If it existed, even as a joke, how long would it be before Twitter started suspending accounts? You go on to say, don't you and the feminists know that you all would be happier cooperating with each other and maybe just maybe becoming BFFs? Someone you can count on who has your back and would rather die than lose your good opinion? Um, do you all... Don't you all, femmes and anti-femmes, know you're weaker and more vulnerable without each other? Together we stand, divided we fall, and fall you all will if you do not come to your senses and stop this war. This will not end well for the human race, you say. Well, that last one remains to be seen. War is an awful thing, but what other answer is there to such senseless hostility other than to lie down and just take the blows? And it's not just our men who are being attacked right now, PB. Middle school boys are being herded into school gymnasiums to take responsibility for violence against women and girls and pledge to stop it, even though, at that age, girls are more likely to assault boys than the other way around. We have pictures of nine-year-old boys on billboards above the slogan, When I grow up, I'm going to beat my wife. We have feminists agitating for programs to teach boys not to rape and to begin placing a burden of original male sin for all the problems of humanity on boys in grade three. All while books with titles like Boys Are Stupid, Throw Rocks at Them, are available at the public library. This is not okay, PB. It's really not to, okay to subject our boys to this. As I said, 
The opening salvo in this war was fired by feminists at Seneca Falls. It has taken men and their advocates over a hundred years to so much as start defending themselves, let alone going on a counteroffensive. And this disagreement between feminists and people like me, it's not a little one. It's not just a matter of, of perspective. It regards foundational axioms of caus causality rather than a few minor points of interpretation. To use an analogy, it's not merely a question like whether the wafer and the wine are truly the body and blood of Christ, or even the question of whether Christ was the Son of God and whether he died for our sins. It's a question of whether the Judeo-Christian God exists in the first place. Such a disagreement may not preclude a partnership in isolated cases on specific issues, any more than my atheism prevents me from dropping my kids' old coats off at a local church so they can be donated to needy families. However, the problem here is not my unwillingness to drop off my children's old coats, because I disagree with the church. It's one of the church refusing to accept those coats unless I agree to be baptized and accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior, or the church only donating those coats to Christian families. Feminism requires and demands that its axioms, the historical, systemic oppression of women by men, yada yada, all of that, to exist as presuppositional truths. Those who do not believe as they do are not to be permitted a platform to speak on issues of gender. I'm going to provide some links in the low bar to support that, and you can have a look at them at your leisure. Even self-described feminists who believe in the historic oppression of women, but who have the temerity to assert that women are no longer oppressed in the Western world, end up on feminism's shit list. They get no platformed, they get uninvited places, uh, they get protested against. It's really not pretty. In one of the most violent of the videos that I have linked below, the Warren Farrell protest, the feminists were protesting a man who was twice elected to the National Organization for Women's New York chapter's board of directors. And at the time of that protest, he still considered himself a feminist. His crime? He wanted to talk about the problems of boys and young men outside of the rubric of feminist doctrine. Many, many men's rights activists, including myself, have attempted to have a dialogue with feminists. As a result, I have been called, in no particular order, a fat, ugly, neckbeard virgin loser who can't get laid, back before I started making videos. A fat, ugly woman who can only get male attention by betraying her own gender, again, before the videos. Uh, I've been called insane, uh, a spousal and child abuser, a battered woman with Stockholm Syndrome, a misogynist, a rape apologist, a domestic violence apologist, self-hating, and just jealous of prettier women. I have... Mommy issues. I have daddy issues. I'm an attention whore. I'm profiting by taking advantage of vulnerable men by convincing them they're victims when they're not. I'm part of a hate movement and I promote hatred and violence. I have even been accused of probably training my daughter to perform fellatio since she was 10 years old, since that's obviously all I think women are good for. End quote. Can you guess what group of people has said those things to and about me? Who has tried to block my speaking engagements when I go to speak at universities? Um, can, can you guess who Ryerson University had to hire all of that extra security to protect me from? And these same people, these feminists, have said and done even worse things to and about male MRAs, male anti-feminists, and as in the case of Gregory Allen Elliott, which I started with this, this video with, even pro-feminist men who have disagreed not even with their beliefs, but with their tactics. You're asking MRAs to stop a war we did not start. You go on to say, have you ever thought of making these arguments to your opponents? Well, Yes, I have done this, and I still do this, face-to-face, -face, through blog posts and videos, and in comment threads online, for seven years, every single day. Every once in a while, a former feminist writes to me thanking me for waking him or her up to reality. 
more often non-feminists write to thank me for saying what they have always wanted to say, or putting into words what they have always felt about men, women, and feminism but couldn't articulate. And I get a lot of emails from men thanking me for giving them hope. Sometimes the hope that I have given them has been that last little bit of hope that they needed not to end their own lives. So, and then you say you all too. You all may find something interesting. You all may actually become happy in the service of a respected and beloved other. Well, I do have someone that I'm committed to, heart and soul, and he's committed to me. It's part of the reason I do this. As is my ex-husband, believe it or not, and as are my sons and my daughter. This is my service to them, to try to help create a better, more compassionate and understanding world for all of them. As for feeling oppressed, I don't feel oppressed, and I don't think my daughter does either. But feeling oppressed is something feminists have been trying to convince us to do uh, for as long as I can remember. For From before I was born, they've been trying to convince women of this. Um, and I don't think that that contributes to a mutual understanding and a mutual partnership and a shared human destiny between men and women at all. And uh, so I don't see any way that I can put this fight down, and I don't see any way that I can try to make some kind of peace with a group of people who believe the way they do about men, about boys, about me and the other, you know, my half of the human race, about what's, what makes us who we are. Um, I, I just can't do it. Uh, there's, there's just too much, too much different there. And so much of what is different is that I am willing to believe in the basic goodness of men and women, and they are not. And I guess that was more than two cents. You gave me your two cents worth. Uh, I gave you a little bit more back. But I definitely return your well wishes, and I hope this helps you understand uh, a little bit of what's going on here. Um, you sound like you just stumbled on all of this and uh, that you haven't really had the time to, to look into and delve into the issues and, uh, and what's behind this animosity. So I hope that this has... Um, at least given you my side of, uh, of the disagreement and uh, my reasons why I don't think that I can cooperate or become BFFs with feminism. So anyway, thank you for your email. I really appreciate hearing from anybody who cares to write to me. And uh, thank you, everybody else, for listening. And I will see you all, hopefully in a day or two, with updates on exactly what the judge had to say. Um, if not, we're doing a round table discussion uh, at the end of today's fireside chat on Honey Badger Radio um, and uh, about the Gregory Allen Elliott verdict and the case. And so essentially you might be watching this after that goes down, but it'll be going up. It's going off live later on today and then, then it'll be uploaded to the Honey Badger Radio channel. And anybody can go and listen to that. Also, uh, our guest for this fireside chat is Ash Scow of the Washington Examiner. And uh, her big bugaboo of late um, is the social justice warrior slash feminazi approach to college uh, rape culture. And uh, she's a very, very articulate uh, young woman um, some of you may remember her from the SPJ Airplay uh, morning panel uh, sitting alongside Alan Bakari and defending gamer gators from the vagaries of the narrative. So I encourage anybody to listen, anybody who's cu you're curious about Gregory Allen Elliott and the verdict, and anybody who is curious about um, what Ash Scow might have to say about college rape culture um, or rape hysteria culture and uh, and all of those things, and also what she might have to say about Mr. Elliot and his victory today. So, see you next time. Bye-bye.